Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so the title of my talk is Taming AI. And the good news is I'm, I'm going to try and persuade you that you already know a lot of stuff that you need to know in order to make progress here. So that's the, the general theme of my talk. But often people like to have a deep and meaningful quote to kick off a talk. So I asked GPT to provide me one because um, I thought that might be appropriate. And so I, I, I asked it, write me a quote about applying experience to new things. And it said, well, you know, experience is a valuable teacher and a powerful tool that can be applied to any new challenge or endeavor. So that's what we're going to try and do today, um, is apply what we already know to this new challenge of AI tools, as I think already been mentioned, um, <coughs> some of them allegedly performing better than, than humans. So, so how can we do it? And the other thing about taming, you know, wh why would we want to tame something? And I asked GPT to explain that to me as well. Um, and I won't read the whole thing, so not to bore you, but um, I, I love the bit where it said it can be a form of entertainment. So, so that's nice, because you can have a lot of fun with this stuff, as I hope to persuade you. Um, however, um, you will have no doubt seen, if, if you've been um, reading uh, the press of various forms, that GPT has had a, a number of critics uh, in various forms. Um, I should have set my do not disturb on there anyway. Um, so yeah, GPT, I think it's been mentioned already, GPT can pass a law exam, but it's terrible at math. Oh no. Um, or GPT, in my, I, love, I love this one. GPT in Microsoft Bing threatens user uh, as AI seems to be losing it. Um, and uh, OpenAI co-founder responds to Elon Musk's criticism that GPT is too woke. Um, so there's those, and uh, the, the ones I think are most common, <laughs> the ones I've heard most often, is, um, is GPT just a confident bullshitter? Um, and does it make things up when it doesn't know the answer? Everybody tells me this, okay? Um, I don't know, how, how many of you have used GPT or, or something like it? So, oh, pretty much everyone. And how many of you agree with, uh, with these criticisms? Or do you think, do you think GPT is um, being got at unfairly? Is that a, you think it's being got at unfairly? I think people don't understand what it does and what it doesn't do. And yeah. so they expect things of it that it's not designed to do, like math. It's a language model, not a math model. So if you ask it to do math, it's not going to be able to do it. So I think there's a lot of intentional misunderstanding about what it does. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm offending it slightly. No, I don't. Um, I mean, I personally think these criticisms are misconceived because um, we can have some more audience participation here. Does anybody know of any other entities that are aggressive, biased, overconfident, making stuff up, bad at maths? I mean, have, have we ever encountered um, such entities? Um, I mean, you know, we, we do deal with them. Uh, this is um, an extremely sanitized view of humanity. This is probably a little bit more accurate. Um, and yet, um, you know, we do actually, despite our flaws, uh, you know, we keep the lights on and we build rockets that go up and buildings that don't fall down and, and so forth and probe the inner workings of the universe. And this is despite, you know, the fact that if you look at each one of us, we're all got loads and loads of flaws and never get anything right, or never get everything right, certainly. So, uh, you know, one wonders uh, why people would even criticize GPT for, for making stuff up. Um, you know, and I think this is the answer. 
Um, I think when people interact with GPT, they do it in the model of two blokes down the pub. I mean, it's sort of in the name, the clues in the name, it's chat GPT. I mean, you know, chat is not really uh, the way that we get things done in life. If, uh, you know, if, if we're down the pub and just having an unstructured conversation and just yapping on about this and that and the other, it, it, it sort of goes, it just meanders about all over the place, doesn't it? And, and, and dare I say it, occasionally we will make stuff up and get things wrong, especially after the third or fourth beer. So, uh, you know, this isn't, if we're going to compare chat GPT with humans, this is kind of how we ought to be comparing um, with, with the sort of the talk down the pub. But that's not how we actually run society. When, when we actually want to get something done, we tend to interact in a rather more structured way. So, for example, you know, I've got courtroom and some girl taking an exam here and somebody having a, um, a consultation with their doctor and somebody wanting to open a bank account and get on a plane. And even when we're not interacting with other humans, when we're interacting with computers, it's quite often in a somewhat structured way of filling in a spreadsheet or filling in some form or whatever. So that's really the, the trick here, that, that we, um, we, we don't want to just sort of yapper on in, in some unstructured way. We want to put some degree of structure onto how we interact. And so I want to propose a thinking strategy that I found to be very useful in um, well, essentially through my career. And uh, because I find that people, they suddenly start to think that they have to think about things in a completely different way and forget about everything that they've previously learned. Um, so uh, as an example, I would cite uh, when email first came along, um, People, uh, you know, there'd be a, a problem with, with, with spam emails and people would say, oh, you know, I've been asked to do this and, 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 and whatever. But I would say to them, look, if somebody came to your door and uh, knocked on it and you opened it and said hello and said, well, can you give me your bank account details? You probably wouldn't do it. But for whatever reason, back in the days when email was first coming along, uh, people uh, sort of felt that it was okay because it was a computer thing and therefore they didn't have to apply their real world common sense. Um, but in fact, I think it's the other way around that you should actually apply what you know about the world uh, to your application of how things go uh, with computers. So the way I do it is I imagine a world uh, before computers, so before the 1940s say, um, I observed that the world functioned, you know, it, didn't, it did exist. Um, and then I'd think, well, how did people solve the problems back in those days? And then I use that as a sort of a thinking device that, that just helps visualize things. But of course, we've got remnants of this on our desktops. You know, we have filing cabinets and, and folders, yes, on our desktops. Well, that's back in the days when people actually used real filing cabinets and so forth. And you know, maybe in the next generation won't find that quite so, quite so helpful. Um, but we found it helpful to think about filing cabinets and folders and in trays and out trays and stuff like that. And then, of course, we weren't constrained by that, but it was a, a useful way to think about things and structure things. Uh, and it prevented the reinvention of wheels because we already knew how to index things. People used to have paper indexes, then they went to uh, computer indexes, but it was the same idea. You didn't have to reinvent that particular notion. Um, but I've um, been slightly sloppy with this slide because I've been talking about computers not existing pre-1940s, but in fact, computers did exist um, in the 1940s, and even quite advanced distributed computer systems existed then. And um, here's one 
that you might be interested in. So this is a, an early distributed computer system. And the computers in here are these ladies. These ladies were called computers. And they were put to work. Uh, this particular photo is from Willow Run Laboratory, which did a lot of um, sensitive work for the US government. But there were similar arrangements in um, uh, Los Alamos and Bletchley Park and places like that. You can see these ladies are, um, you, you probably can't, it's not a very good photo, um, but here's a better photo. Um, they're using these things called merchant machines. And in fact, I actually had one of these at school. Uh, when I saw that photo, I thought, bloody hell. Uh, and I still don't know how to operate that. Um, so yeah, they're wonderful devices. But, um, Here's a little comment from Los Alamos about these computers. Um, so these ladies would, would process 10 to 14 digit numbers using their merchant machines. But then of course, you had multiple sources of error here because the merchant machines would break. Um, and of course, the ladies would occasionally make an error, much more often than even the most unreliable computer. Um, but despite that, you know, it cracked the enigma and got the atom bomb working and so on and so forth. So again, there's a, there's a clue here that, that we actually know how to deal with these alleged um, uh, problems that the GPT uh, currently has. Uh, and in fact, this went on for quite some time. You can see this is a, a rather more modern looking photograph. This is a, a NASA computer system uh, at the Jet Propulsion labo Laboratory. I think it's from the early 60s. So, you know, just a few years later, we were landing people on the moon, and this was the uh, computer system that, that did quite a bit of the work to, to, to do it. So, um, what was involved here? Um, I mean, how do we cope with human flaws? And um, this is not an exhaustive list, but I just put it up here so that you get a sense of what I'm talking about. Um, the first thing, and in fact it'll be part of the demo that I do, one of the core aspects of the demo, is that we constrain what a person can do. So for example, I can't just go out and give you financial or medical advice because I'm not a trained doctor or, or investment advisor. And, and rightly so. Yeah? Now, if I was down the pub talking with you, I might say about some stock you want to buy or, or, or why your knee's hurting, but you really shouldn't trust me when I, when I say that, okay? So it's the same situation as, as, as we have with uh, Chad GPT in that context. But we have a whole toolbox, <coughs> excuse me, we have a to whole toolbox of techniques that we have developed over the millennia of human civilization of how to deal with unreliable, um, units of computation, i.e. humans, um, and, and when we put them together, we actually get um, reliable outcomes. So uh, we delegate tasks to specialists, we escalate problems uh, when they can't be handled by the lower ranks, as it were. Uh, if somebody's sick or, you know, we, we stand in for them, we quality control inputs and outputs. Uh, we make decisions by consensus. That's a very powerful technique underlying quite a lot of machine learning as well, obviously. Um, and of course, we, we gradually try to automate parts of the job that are better done by automated systems. So, you know, we no longer have ladies adding numbers up uh, and multiplying them because we have better ways to do that. Um, so, in summary, what we have is we have effectively two Techniques. One is to develop processes, uh, of which I suppose the gold standard process is the scientific method. That you know, if you want to avoid bullshitting, then the scientific method is is custom designed, or should be custom designed, to eliminate the bullshitting. Not always perfectly, but eventually, usually, even in the cases of scientific fraud, uh, we do get there in the end. We do tease the truth out. 
Uh, and more prosaically, we, we have recipes, yeah? Um, we can avoid an awful lot of disasters in the kitchen if we just follow a recipe that's been, um, that's been tested previously. So, um, so that's the processes side. And then we obviously need to host these processes in some sort of institution, whether it's a grandiose one like a regular or a, or a corporation or a team. Uh, and that enables these processes, it gives them a home to, to, to operate in. Um, <coughs> so, um, here's a workflow for getting a library book out of a library. I don't know if you can see that, it doesn't really matter. <coughs> you can imagine uh, when you go in the library, if, you, if the book's there, that's great, but if it's not there, then you have to sort of put in a request for it to be retained when whoever it was that um, uh, had loaned it brings it back. And so you can, you, can um, you can define this, and of course workflow systems, well, the concept of workflow has been around for hundreds and hundreds of years, um, but workflow systems in the sort of IT sense have been around certainly since the 90s, um, and they allow um, computers and humans to interact with each other in a structured and disciplined fashion. Uh, and you can sort of draw nice diagrams that, that display exactly what it is that you're supposed to do and how you're supposed to do it. Um, so this kind of gives us a framework for taming AI, I would suggest. Um, we have almost a sort of a, a spectrum here, um, you know, ranging from AI getting it right every single time, well, that's easy then. You just got an automated process. Just wrap it in a box, put an API on it, um, and the thing works, and you're very, very happy. Then you have situations where AI gets it right most of the time. Well, how do you cope with that? Well, some sort of QA, some sort of compensating actions. Again, workflow systems already know how to do this because, um, you know, those workflow systems that have to deal with um, APIs that used to work on unreliable network systems, uh, for example, you couldn't always rely on the API giving you an answer back. And in fact, we may see a demonstration of that soon when I come to do my demo, because uh, I'm going to rely on uh, APIs uh, trying to talk to um, remote systems. Uh, so it is possible to, to code up a, a workflow to, to compensate for not being able to get through on the phone, as it were. But you can also have a compensation for what happens if it fails its QA. Um, moving on, maybe gets it right um, some of the time. Well, that can still be useful, because if you can offload 10% of somebody's workflow, uh, work, uh, workload, well, that's better than the guy having to do 100% of the work. Okay. So even if you can't do much, even if you can only do 5 or 10%, that's still worth having. Um, and then, of course, if AI gets it wrong none of the time, then, well, you have to stick with humans. Um, but you can see that there's this sort of arrow, the pressure as things get better, things that you currently uh, would need a human for might become things that an AI gets right at least some of the time, and so forth. And a, an important thing here is that, um, I mean, we always have these sort of public inquiries where people say, lessons have been learned. And of course, you know, it's never true because you keep having public inquiries that say lessons have been learned. Um, but that's because humans aren't that great at learning lessons, although we do learn some. I mean, planes are a lot more reliable than they were 50 or 80 years ago. So, you know, we're, we're not that bad, but... Um, for AI, every error becomes a learning opportunity. It becomes an, uh, an opportunity to create a, a data set which can then drive further improvement. So that's the framework that I want to propose where we can sort of start to think how we can take even unreliable stuff or allegedly unreliable stuff like ChatGPT and, and put it into a framework which we already know how to operate and use to actually make significant improvements in, in where we currently are. And then, of course, there's the, um, uh, there's the institution side of it, which is quite an interesting 
question, uh, to which I don't know the answer, I should hasten to add. So these are just highly speculative thoughts. Um, we kind of have been here before. Um, we've, um, uh, when, when search engines came out, it wasn't entirely clear how that would pan out. Well, the way it panned out in the case of search engines is Google pretty much took 90% of the market. And uh, then we were left with highly local search engines, such as you get in SharePoint, for dealing with private data. Um, and it isn't obvious how things are going to uh, pan out institutionally with this new wave of AI. Um, I'd just like to offer some arguments against having sort of a Google of AI. Um, and, and some of them are here. Um, to some extent, it's a sledgehammer. Now, I suppose one could say, well, so what if it's a sledgehammer if it's sufficiently cheap? Uh, but at the moment, it's not completely cheap. You have to pay uh, in tokens for, for AI processing. So um, it, it, it's perhaps not economically effective to use a massive great big language model to do some of the simple stuff that I'm about to show you. Um, but perhaps more uh, cogently, the stuff's proprietary. You know, we have unopen AI at the moment uh, in terms of the, uh, the language models that are, that are actually successful. And we've got a burgeoning open movement to, to, to try and change that. But they're not quite so great yet. Uh, and of course, clearly, this is highly unsuitable for private data. You, you really are not going to take private confidential data and give it to OpenAI or, or whoever. Um, so there's that challenge to solve. So it's the same challenge we had with search, but it's perhaps less obvious how, how that uh, gets dealt with. Um, and of course, we've, we've heard about the cost of doing this. We've got you know, to train a very large model, as has been pointed out already, takes six months and millions of pounds. Not really the sort of budget or time frame that an SME will be uh, very happy with. So those are the arguments against a supermodel. But what's the alternative? Well, the alternative is a, is kind of a swarm, a bit like people. We, we, we take people and we build them into teams and corporations. And each individual person isn't that uh, productive, that able to do that much. But if we put enough of them together and put a process around them, uh, then we can achieve uh, quite a bit. And similarly, we, we, can, we can attempt to do that with, um, with AI components. Um, so for example, it is possible. In fact, I have a, a language model that runs on my little MacBook Air. It's only a 24 uh, gigabyte RAM machine. It's not a particularly powerful thing, but it can run a language model. It's nowhere near as good as ChatGPT, uh, but you know, give it give it a bit of time. Um, and if you have tasks that are sufficiently lightweight um, to uh, to actually cope with that, it's kind of the an uh, analog of putting the intern on the simple task in your company. Uh, you don't want to put your most expensive, highly experienced employee on a simple task. If it's a simple task, by definition, one would hope it can be done in a simpler way. So, um, you know, there are, uh, there are ways to harness the, the workflow uh, framework um, to, to build a swarm of uh, components, each of which might be not very powerful, but which, taken together, uh, provide a useful system. And by the way, this doesn't, this isn't, as it were, an alternative to a supermodel, because you can incorporate the supermodel into that swarm. Uh, so if you have a particularly knotty problem, you can just punt it up to that. Um, so yeah, the, 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 that's kind of what I was mentioning, that you can have workflow frameworks coordinating the behavior of individual processing components. How am I doing for time? 
Uh, fairly good. I did start late. Um, so <coughs> let me just try and put some flesh on the somewhat abstract bones here uh, by giving you two very simple demos. But I hope they illustrate some of the points I've been making. Um, the first is to extract value out of text. And the example I'm going to show you is, is a medical note. And uh, don't worry, it's all anonymized and, and, and open, uh, open source. Um, but the trouble with, with, with these particular notes is that you have to sort of ask who benefits. So they're done by doctors for the benefit of doctors. But there's another actor here that, who could potentially benefit, but the doctor isn't motivated to help them, usually. And uh, so the other actor is some statistical analyst who might want to uh, look at a load of um, medical notes uh, to uh, control for age. Uh, and, and the problem there is that these medical notes, and I do apologize uh, to people in the back row who won't be able to see it, uh, but they, the, the idea you need to get from this is it's just totally unstructured. Uh, it, people, they could say, why don't people just fill in a form? And the answer is because they can't be bothered. They don't want to, it's too much effort. They don't get any benefit from that. So, um, but nevertheless, this a uh, piece of text is full of useful information. And one of the pieces of information in there is the age of the patient. And those people on the front row, can you tell me what the age of the patient is? Three. Sorry? Three. It is 30, yes, you're quite right. Uh, there it is, okay? It's, uh, it's easier if I highlight it. But hopefully you can see that um, I'm now highlighting all the other numbers in here. There's quite a few. And um, if I was to give this task to a data entry clerk and say, right, here's a, um, uh, a medical note, tell me what the age is, and then do the other 100. What success rate do you think they would have? Well, I would suggest that they're not going to be perfect. They will occasionally get it wrong. Um, so um, although this is a almost too simple example. I, I've deliberately chosen a simple one so that it's, you don't need to know any medicine to understand what an age is, okay? And um, so we can construct some sort of age extraction workflow. This again is hugely uh, simplified. But one could say, well, okay, well, you extract an age, and now you've got an age as a structured piece of data. And now, of course, you can apply all the information. So when we said chat GPT was bad at maths, well, it might be bad at maths, but computers are not bad at maths. We can certainly check whether this age is greater than 130 and express some surprise if it is. Okay? And so um, let's see if I can just get the demo up and running. So um, we had one failure because I didn't have internet. And then the second time around, it he got it right. Uh, but you might say, well, that's rather, rather simple. Um, so since I've actually had to get out of here, I'm going to paste in the, um, the actual medical text that I showed you a moment ago. Now, obviously, this isn't the appropriate UI for doing this stuff, but um, you'll get the idea. Oh, I do. I do beg uh, for right an hour for view. So there we go. Um, and you know, it was whoever said it was thirty was correct, and that is the same answer that um, ChatGPT gave, though somewhat more quickly once, once we got the internet connected up. Um, but you might say, well, ChatGPT um, 
bullshit all the time. So we could say, okay, um, oh, sorry. Um, Right, so it hasn't actually come up with an age, you'll notice. It's found there's an error in here because, um, you know, I've put in some text that doesn't really make sense um, for somebody who's trying to extract age from text. Okay? Um, and if I want to show off a little bit and, and tempt fate, I might sort of say, uh, oh, I don't know, John... Got a 25 year old car for his 18th birthday. Trying to trick the thing into saying that it's 25 years old. Um, but no, it doesn't get fooled by that. It does actually say 18 and not 25 for the car. So you can see, if, if anyone was tempted to try to do this with regular expressions, I think you would come a cropper very, very quickly. Um, and obviously, this demo, um, well, if I can go back to um, my, my PowerPoint, and oh, it's back up there, right. So just to review, what happened? Well, just to review uh, that and, and sort of relate it back to the um, to the critical newspaper headlines that we started this talk with. Um, Chat GPT makes things up when it doesn't know the answer, and is Chat GPT just a confident bullshitter? Well, um, my answer to that is not if it's constrained. That is the trick. If you just say, chat GPT, just say anything you want, right? And then you're going to say, oh, I'm really surprised. I've been told a load of nonsense. Well, how surprising is that real? But if you say to it, I want you to tell me this and nothing else, um, and you tweak a few parameters, which are important to do, um, then it will, I mean, I haven't done much in the way of testing of this. This is very much hot off the press type of demo. But I haven't managed to get it to go wrong. In, in other words, I haven't managed to get it to bullshit me to an incorrect age. And I haven't managed it to get me to claim it's found an age when there is no age there and so on and so forth. It, it is actually quite robust in that rather narrow field. And that's the point I'm trying to get across, that if the field is sufficiently narrow, then some of these uh, criticisms um, don't don't really stand up. Uh, now, is it 100% accurate? I'd be surprised if it was 100%. But, as I think has been uh, mentioned in the previous talk, humans aren't 100%. So the question is, where's our bar? And I'd be, I'd be willing to take a bet, even before doing much in the way of statistical uh, analysis here, that it probably already is more accurate than a data entry plan. And of course, and here's going back to my theme of we already know how to fix these things, um, we already know how to improve accuracy with unreliable data plans. So by using the exact same techniques, we can improve accuracy if ChatGPT isn't accurate, providing we use a different model or even use ChatGPT with perhaps some different temperatures and uh, setup parameters, uh, we can actually create a sort of a, a voting system where, you know, if four, four out of five models agree, then we're probably correct. And if everybody's in disagreement, then we punt it up to a human, okay, and then use that as, as learning. So, um, so yeah, that's, uh, th that's how I sort of counter those two particular criticisms uh, that I started with with ChatGPT. And I'm just wondering whether I shouldn't stop there uh, or whether 
Because I do have a second demo. <laughs> um, all right, I can, I, I'll, I'll try and squeeze a second demo in. All right, OK. So um, my second demo is about moderation, but it's also about uh, trying to show you how you can sort of mix and match uh, different models into, into, into the whole, as it were. Um, so yeah, how is other people, and of course anyone who's been on an internet forum will, will understand what I mean by that. Um, and so there's a big market in sentiment analysis. Um, and the demo I'm going to show you is, uh, is a two-part uh, system. I'm going to rush it a little bit and go straight to the workflow. Um, so the first sentiment analyzer is just a remarkably stupid sentiment analyzer from about uh, 13 months ago. So ancient technology. Um, and it really just says whether the sentiment is negative, positive, or neutral. And it's the sort of technology that's been used by the likes of Facebook and, and other people like that uh, to try and reduce the cost of their uh, human moderation activity. Um, but then, if, the, if that sort of primitive sentiment analyzer comes up with a negative sentiment, then I pass it through uh, the GPT model that has been trained to detect annoyance. Okay. Now, annoyance is not the same as a negative sentiment. So, uh, uh, as I will, in fact, rather than waffle all about it, let me just do the uh, demo. Um, so, if I say I am very happy, it actually su surprisingly says that's a neutral sentiment. Okay. It just shows how good the sentiment that analyzer is. Okay. Um, but I might say, um, uh, I keep reading my passion. Uh, so, uh, for those who can't see, I'm very sad because my dog is poor. Now, that's a negative sentiment, one would hope. But I'm not annoyed. I'm certainly not annoyed with the person I'm talking to. Um, I'm just sad because my dog's in a bad way, having eaten too much food in the or whatever it is grabbed off the kitchen table. So here we are. The first, well, well first of all, it said it was analyzing it, but then the second statement was from the um, primitive sentiment analyzer that said it was a negative sentiment, and that triggered a call to ChatGPT, uh, which was asked to detect whether there was any annoyance in there. Okay? Um, and you know, I'll just finish off the demo, I suppose, by, by saying, um, let's make Amelia Green Lion Gary demo. Right. And so this time, it doesn't detect, detect the annoyance, and it will actually send me, uh, there we go, just come in. This makes me, this is where we said it, came in uh, through the email system, escalated to a human who will hopefully do something about it. So, um, just going back. Right, I have to figure out how to on that edit. So, just to review that, um, you know, some of the criticisms were ChatGPT threatens user. Um, and, you know, Alan Musk. Criticizing GPT for being too woke. Well, actually, that's an interesting problem because you know there are people who think that we can be impartial. But of course, we can't. No system can be impartial. You always have a worldview. You always have whatever bias you have. Okay, um, and and so different. And you know, if you're running the Samaritans, you will have a different set of requirements for how to handle interactions from if you're running. Same as Google, for instance. Okay. So there isn't a one size fits all for moderation. It, it'll be context and culture dependent, one would imagine. And so it's important to that, uh, I mean, this I think is a good argument against why we can't just have a single Uber um, 
Uber model that, that dominates everything like Google does. Uh, because we'll, we'll need some of this to, to actually adapt to people's different requirements. But notice at no stage was I worried that my demo would go off on a rant uh, and start insulting people and so forth. It is possible to control that. And that's kind of what I uh, first of talk. And just my final slide. We started off treating humans as producers. Um, then we sort of invented information processing to take some of the load off. We invented workflow to help orchestrate the stuff. Now we've invented software <coughs> in the form of people, uh, things like ChatGPT, which, which actually is useful to think of as humans. Because if we do think of them as humans, uh, we can actually plug that straight back in to all of the mechanisms and systems we have developed over the millennia to have control humans. So that's basically it. That's my talk. And thanks for listening. And uh, do we have time for questions? Or? Uh, if not, then I'm around. Uh, Great. Great. So good idea of objectives and coach Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. Thank you so much.